also we grab some stuff and try to sneak out in our own personal locomotive without being crushed by the giant iron train. Well, it turns out the big bad iron train isn't going to make it out here to run me over. In fact, it looks like it got blocked by biter activists yet again. Oh man, the train got wrecked twice already in such a short time span. This is not a good sign for the rest of the playthrough. How the heck are we supposed to transport all from the outposts to the base then? Boat belts and trains turn out to be an unreliable way and don't even get me started about bots. They'll fly straight over the cuckoo's nest and get absolutely obliterated together with whatever they're carrying. I see only one solution, but oh my, it's a crazy one. And perhaps solution is a bit of an overstatement for what I have in mind, if we can pull it off at all that is. I wouldn't know, I haven't tried this before and I don't think anyone has. Whatever it is, and if it turns out to be doable, we will have to find out next time. Anyway, at the moment we don't have much time to worry about it. We need to claim our resources before the biters do it by settling a nice indestructible biter base right on top of the ore patches. So we perform our usual strategy and just hope for the best and push on out towards the copper patch. With me now dual wielding my exoskeletons, I'm a lot less scared to trigger the biters as I can probably escape them now. As you may have guessed, the two empty cargo wagons are destined for copper ore, so we copy the current train station layout to the copper patch. Before we try to encase it as tightly as possible with our flamethrower wall defense. And again, before we build anything polluting or offensive, we first call over the train to deliver some oil. And only after the pipe infrastructure is complete, we start placing flamethrowers again, so they are immediately fueled. With no personal defense against big biters, the consequences of accidentally triggering an attack before we are ready could be disastrous. But eventually we get it done, and now that we are safe, we will leave building the mine to the bots again. Contrary to the iron ore patch, we do have full control over the entire copper ore patch. It is time to call over the train and definitively add the copper outpost to its schedule. As usual, it doesn't take more than mere moments before the biters are gathering for an attack on the copper mine. Anyway, we are done here. Let's ride the train home where we can enjoy the fruits of our labor. Or, well, we could have if we had remembered to also build a copper unloading station. Anyway, I'll quickly put that down while you can watch the copper mine being under immediate heavy attack. And the spitters are targeting the copper belts, destroying our supply chain before it's even delivered the first load. Well, I wasn't prepared for that, so we return to add some extra belt related supplies to the copper roboport network. 
hand, we seize the opportunity to also lay out some more redundant power lines to the outpost, in case some biter is unable to pathfind around the only power pole in sight on the prairie. Anyway, the stone mine, which is in the way of my soon to be base building area, is close to running out. So we reposition the miners to speed up extracting the last drops. Before we fabric cobble together yet another temporary -ish setup to make cliff explosives, which we will definitely fully automate elsewhere soon, instead of using this abomination here for the rest of the game. And just like that, the stone mine has fully run out, so we can finally clear out our building area. And soon we are left with just a broken spaceship, a sad little tree, and a couple of chests of rocks. With iron and copper somewhat secured, we set out to make a different plan to claim some stone and coal for the base. Behold the Terrain Claimer 2000 Limited Edition Copyright Register Trademark. Now it may look like just any regular old flamethrower wall defense, exactly like the one we already have. And yeah, well it is. But it has an additional refined concrete part around the outside. Not that I can ever be bothered to actually make refined concrete. Oh no, on the contrary. It just serves as a visual representation of our flamethrower's maximum range, so we can accurately determine the correct distance we need to place it away from the biter bases. By using a tile we will never produce, we are 100% sure our bots will never actually try to fly out and place the refined concrete right under a biter base or something. But we need to stay safe while being outside of our walls. So we first stamp down 400 accumulators. Not that we have any, but that's about to change thanks to this nifty temporary assembler square. Which will exactly produce the 400 accumulators we need. And if we use the red passive provider chests again, the base bots will automatically install all of them over time. But why do we need the accumulators? Well, we're going to need something to defend ourselves out there. Something better than the directional flamethrower, or the clumsy to use gun turret with manual ammo insertion. So let's use some more of these nifty assembler squares to produce 200 laser turrets for us. Laser turrets are great for my monkey brain to finger coordination skills. As long as there's power, we can just place them down anywhere and they'll just work. It was a great progress in warfare technique when we got rid of the pointing part of the point and click weapons, reducing them to just simply click, and they'll shoot anything that moves by themselves. Great stuff! Oh yeah, meanwhile I got so distracted I failed to notice a minor problem. Our coal mine is unable to keep up with demand, and we have entered the classical factorio power spiral of death, where not enough coal is supplied to the boilers, which starts a brownout, which reduces coal production, which further reduces coal delivery to the boilers, which worsens the brownout, and so on, until your whole base dies down. Now we have plenty of coal in our coal patch remaining, the problem is the rate at which we can extract it. We just physically cannot fit enough miners on the coal patch. So unfortunately, even though our oil source is very poor, we have no choice but to switch to the oil based solid fuel to supply our power plant and furnaces. We quickly hand feed a chest full of the stuff, which will hopefully give us the time we need to set up a properly automated solid fuel delivery line to the power plant. Mm. 
so we hurry up to set up a bunch of solid fuel assemblers. And manage to connect the belt just before the blackout occurs. Phew, that was a close call. Little Johnny cheers us on from a distance. Our small success is swiftly followed by a big loss. A group of biters kills one of our solar powered raiders. That is not the loss I'm talking about. Those biters are on the way to settle on this copper ore patch, which means one of the few available copper patches has now been lost forever. We desperately take a look around the fully revealed map to see if there's any way out to discover more resources later on. But as the distance from spawn grows, the biter bases grow in size as well as in frequency. And the biter bases quickly become so densely packed together, there's just no escape. No space for us to squeeze through anywhere. And even if there was, it would just lead us into more biters just outside of you. So we have no choice but to incur the loss and push on. Our solid fuel plan is not watertight, as we rely solely on white oil. So in case it runs out, we connect a backup coal line with a small chest buffer while keeping input priority on the solid fuel. It's a sloppy setup, but it will have to do for a while at least. Anyway, there's also some good news. Our 200 laser turrets are done, which means we can go out and conduct the experiment, which will decide the future fate of the base. We temporarily disable the ore train and head out to the problem zone. The area where our train keeps getting pummeled and sometimes even destroyed completely by literal biter masses. We are here to conduct an experiment to see if we can do something about it. And this is a great place to test it out, as there's only one spitter nest and one cute small little worm. With our power armor and energy shields, we are past the point where he can be a problem. We can just completely ignore him while we try to encircle the spitter nest with walls. And since spitters have no armor, we can even shoot down the big spitters with relative ease. But unlike the small worms, the big spitter's acid attack still hurts me plenty. But I'm too young to die, so I become the worst nightmare and ultra violence them into spitter heaven. Around and around we go, wall layer after wall layer. We are trying to find out if there's a maximum spawn distance, but it doesn't seem so. The more walls we place, the further out the nest spawns the spitters. It may just be the case that the nest just keeps selecting the closest non-obstructed tile to spawn a spitter. 4 layers. 5 layers. Six layers and they are still spawning. This seems hopeless. Six layers and hope, another one spawns on the south. One more wall. And suddenly... Silence. No more spawns. We did it. The proof of concept worked. Hey, that was not too rough. The spawner itself does seem to have a strange hitbox though, with random walls sticking in and unplaceable walls where it looks like it should be possible to place walls. 
Also, spitters were clearly spawning through six layers of walls on the north, west and south side, but on the east side, somehow six walls seem sufficient. Anyway, while we still have some figuring out to do on the best configuration, the proof of concept works, which is very encouraging. Of course, there is no way we can pull off the displayed strategy on a normal biter base with dozens of nests, big worms all around and massive amounts of biters spawning in. That is gonna be quite a different story than doing it on this isolated single splitter spawner. But it did work, which means we can now move the rails directly next to the now disabled spitter spawner, moving it out of harm's way, as the old location was a popular biter hangout spot, where they would gather around, be up to no good, and kept stopping my ore train cold in its tracks. Hopefully this move will solve the problems we had with our ore train getting pummeled and destroyed all the time. Anyway, that's enough hard labor for one day, let's take the train back to the base. Oof, well that didn't work out exactly like I wanted it to, Lamau. Let's try again. Yeah, look at those biters scrambling, not knowing what to do. Attack the walls, join this nest, join that nest. Oh, bad plan, man. Those poor biters get sent straight to the front lines for the next attack. <laughs> anyway, we already claimed iron and copper, but we will need to claim some coal and stone, as well as some more space to build a base. So here's the plan, man. We will try to extend the base out to the small northern stone patch, locking out the big spitter nest between the wall and the lake. These two worms here are gonna have to be part of our base. They are both unstoppable forces, but fortunately for us they are also immovable objects. We can just stay out of their way and ignore them, I guess. The small expansion in the northwest consists of just two spawners, without any protecting worms. A great next target to try out the just developed cover them in concrete strategy. We then plan to turn back south, keeping clear of all the other northern nests, before making another outcrop to the west, where my strategically sprinkled out random belt clusters have so far succeeded in demotivating any enemy expansion directly west of our base. It won't stay that way forever though, so claim it now we must. Then, if we continue out and turn the walls out only just before we bump into this massive nest, we can end up at the southern lake edge, encompassing both the coal peninsula and the big biter expansion into our perimeter. I'm pretty sure we won't be able to wall in those guys though, so we'll likely have to find yet another solution to keep those biters at bay. Alright, the master plan has been laid out. Let's see if it survives first contact with the enemy. So we utilize our Terrain Claimer 2000 to measure out the wall and the flamethrower's vertical axis. And I have a surprise for you, which will surely bring some fireworks. Oh, they're coming. More on that later then I guess. Let's enjoy their final attack. Oh, holy smokes! Well, lesson learned I guess. We will still have to be very careful out there. Those big guys can still shred us to pieces in no time. Power armor be damned. Alright, the proper alignment has been prepared, let's go for it. First we place the pipes, hoping not to trigger any enemies just yet.
Then the wall. Oh, quickly. Shit. Retreat. Let's lead them out and lob some projectiles back at them, shall we? May the best lobber win. Heh, <laughs> easy game. GG, guys. Okay, the coast seems clear. Let's quickly draw down this wall. And then quickly fill in the flamethrowers before the spitters break through. And that is the stacked asset slowdown effect for you. Mission complete. The spitters are now forever locked into their beachside holiday homes. Until they learn to swim. Or to fly. Maybe in the expansion? So let's celebrate with the fireworks I promised. The eternal fireworks, as this flamethrower will keep firing at that indestructible enemy nest until the end of time. Or until my oil runs out, whichever happens first. We then use our first cliff explosives to increase the spitter's freedom of movement. Yeah, I know, I'm such a generous guy. Before doubling down on the wall. Well, the end of time may arrive a little later than expected, so we halved the number of ever firing flamethrowers to one, with support from the five backup dancers, which kill off the never ending stream of spawning spitters. First wall complete. Nice. There is a slight problem though. We are polluting the nearby northern nests like crazy and they will send in giant attacks which will attack our shiny new fireworks in the back and utterly destroy it. So we must waste no time and push on, hoping to outspeed them. With the northern nest pretty close by the stone mine, we plan a wall back far enough so that we can just barely mine out all the stone. We quickly connect an oil pipeline, but it's too late. An attack comes in from the north. Now, big biters are a lot more resilient to gunfire and grenades, but as there's only a pair of them, I can dance them down no problem. Back up, we must connect the flamethrowers and build the wall. And we would have failed severely were it not for the fact that the giant biter attack group chooses to go around the west side of the forest. We dodged yet another bullet there, but for how long can my luck hold up? Anyway, eventually we managed to complete the wall. And correctly connect the oil. And we throw a quick glance at the eternal barbecue party to see if he ran out of oil already. Not yet. Anyway, so I do need to assimilate this spawner pair into my base. I made an 8 wall tick blueprint to fit around any individual nest, which should make sure there can be no spawns, no matter what the exact subpixel location of the nest turns out to be. Both nests turn out to be spitter spawners, so no fast, highly armored and hard chomping biters to deal with. Just the soft, squishy spitters. Let's go for it.
Well, I am not using my personal bots as they will get splash damaged and one-shotted, trying to repair each other and the walls. That took quite a while to build by hand. This strategy really is not going to be viable on anything large and dangerous. Anyway, another submission, submission successful. So let's go do a victory dance with the two medium Johnnies over here. And whoops, an unplanned fly out of my personal bots. Well, I'm sure that won't lead to anything dramatic. I'll just wait here for them to return and... Oh no! The north wall has been flanked by a biter attack group and I still didn't disable my personal bots. This is gonna be costly and I have the greatest trouble wearing down the big biters while they chomp on me and my stuff. Surprisingly this debacle cost me only 11 of my bots. Anyway, let's patch up that problem with this very easy solution which we should have applied when we were here initially. I bet every language has its own proverb for this situation. The Dutch one roughly translates to Only after the cow has already drowned, one covers the well. Let me know the one in your language in the comments. Time to resupply and oh man, another unplanned bot fly out. For this one we also have a proverb which translates to Even a donkey doesn't bump into the same stone twice, let alone tries. Anyway, we made it back to the base to resupply and let's take a bunch of extra bots with us to account for any future mishaps which are almost certain to happen I guess. Back out we go and not a minute too early because the biters breached the new north wall again on the flank. Anyway, maybe you noticed already earlier, but in order to assimilate the walled and spawner pair, we can only turn the perimeter wall down south dangerously close to this big biter base here. Let's see how it goes. Are you kidding me? I ain't no fool, or at least not all of the time. Trying to rush build this with only flamethrowers seems guaranteed suicide, so we start drawing our power first. And we throw down a few handfuls of laser turrets to protect our back while we try to build the wall. Let's now see how it goes.
Well, somehow the biters let us put it up with surprisingly little resistance. Anyway, this corner is so close to the nest, as soon as the flamethrowers fire once, it will likely be under continuous attack as the newly spawned biters immediately get called in to aid the just spawned generation before them, which is currently very busy dying in the flamethrower fire. Anyway, we draw the wall down south and carefully approach this giant attack group. Man, what is wrong with these biters? Don't they know how the game works? I'm standing so close by I could almost deconstruct them with my go go gadget arms, yet they are just ignoring me. Well, let's force their attention then. Anyway, eventually we reach our current base's corner and connect up the walls. The first real base wall expansion has been successful, but it's also by far the easiest one we will have to pull off. We still have the western coal peninsula to claim and eventually we will have to try to grow our entire base all the way around the iron and copper as well, assimilating every biter base inside inside. Will we succeed in doing so? Will our luck keep up? Won't our oil run out? All of these questions will be answered in the next episode of Biter Ball Z.